What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final final little pass is a business. Dead Meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, your horror safe haven. I'm Chelsea. And I'm James, and we're married, and we like to get scared together. Forgot my wedding ring, Again. just realized. I'm sorry. Someone made a montage, I think, of you on Reddit forgetting it. Yeah. And I saw a lot of people being like, I thought you kind of just wear them all the time. I don't. I get paranoid that I'm going to lose it. Well, also, I never leave the house. There's no fucking reason to wear it when I'm sitting around the yeah. house. Anyway, we have a guest here. Joe. <laughs> we have a guest here. Joe. Our friend Joey's here. Hey, Joey everybody. Clift. My name's Joey Clift, comedian, TV writer, and I'm married to this glass of water. Yay. Yay. Congratulations. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joey, since uh, this is your third time on the podcast. Uh, Although we did... people can only watch one of the previous yeah, episodes. Yeah, our first episode was Indian Burial Grounds. Then we did Horror and Wrestling, uh, RIP, that episode on YouTube. You can still listen to it. Yes. Maybe Triple H will let us put it back. Yeah, yeah, I feel like Triple H is probably a nicer guy than Vince right? was. Yeah, yeah, WWE blocked that uh, video on YouTube yeah. due to using footage over us just talking about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, they just they don't want people to talk about their product, I, I guess. I guess not, you yeah, know? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't either <laughs> a couple of years ago. Yeah, some of Lately, that. it's been good. Yeah, 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 yeah. And since it's your third episode, I realize this is your, I think you're our first hat trick. At Gressel, I'm sorry, what? you kind of were, but you live here, so it's different. Yeah. Uh, so Do I get a jacket? Is this like the SNL Five Timers Well, club? you get a, we're all going to wear silly hats this episode. Yay. Yeah. And I realized, Gressel, we did make you wear a silly hat one episode because we had you dress as Raiden from Mortal Kombat, so yeah. that works. We had him dress as Christopher Lambert. As Christopher Raiden. Lambert, Raiden, Raiden yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we first we have this like construction minor. helmet. I'm saving it's the best hat. Very fun. Okay. We have a blue velvet top hat. Oh, I like the blue velvet top hat. It might be actually. Okay. We've got this green leprechaun what? helmet, not a helmet hat. I can't reach some of these. We've got a cool, this is like a bad guy in Westworld hat. It's a black <laughs> hat. We've got just an, like a pretty down to earth straw hat. We've got a taxi driver hat. Oh, and that's fun. We all can't we can't fight over this one. Alright, let's be simple because <laughs> okay, I know roll, we all want to win. Roll. This very tiny bowler <laughs> hat. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's your choice, but I think. Okay, I mean, look, I do want. You the, gotta wear the little <laughs> tiny hat. I do hat. want the tiny hat. <laughs> it's okay, really everybody, good. Here we go. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Which one do you want, James? Uh, I'll do the cowboy hat. Which one? The oh yeah. So there's two. Do you want to be good cowboy I'll or be bad good guy? You be good cowboy. Okay. Yeah. There you go. I'm Where gonna be this a come taxi from? driver. We have so many hats. It's from all the various. Hill counts and yeah. bits that That's we true. do. I feel like when you do comedy, you definitely just develop a weird collection of like props and costumes and hats that just live in a closet somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yes. absolutely. Or multiple closets. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Okay, now we have our silly hats on. I yeah. feel much better. Now we can talk very seriously about <laughs> this film, Prey, which just came out straight to streaming, which is kind of wild. This would have been such a cool movie to see in a theater. Yeah, like we were saying last night when we watched it, I think by going to straight to streaming, more people will see it because even though it's really good and I think it's getting very positive word of mouth, I think it's much easier to say, hey, that new Predator movie's out, it's on Hulu, go check it out, as opposed to being like, go to the theater and watch it. A lot more people are going to watch it on Hulu, I think. Yeah, it was, uh, I um, was invited to the premiere earlier this week and like I saw, I saw it in a theater full of people. Nice. And it was just such a great experience to oh, see I it bet. with. Yeah. I mean, like there were so many like crowd pleasing moments, so many huge cheers, mm -hmm. especially like uh, like I'm native. It was an all native audience, so like whenever any native person did something cool, the audience screamed. Yeah. Um, so Which, like that's the whole movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really, it was just nonstop <laughs> screaming and clapping for an hour and forty minutes. And uh, yeah, like I, I guess that I'm, I'm bummed out that I can't experience it with large groups of people mm -hmm. more. You know, um, like I get the reasoning behind having it go straight to streaming, but I also feel like this is a movie that for sure would have been the number one movie at the box office this weekend. Let's see. What, did Bullet Train come out this weekend? Is anyone seeing Bullet Train? I think so. I think really? Bullet Train is doing okay. I know that Nope is not doing super oh, great. It's bummer. doing fine, but like, so I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I try to follow the box office stuff nowadays. Yeah, but but uh, 
Predator is like the number two trend in the United States on Twitter right now. Yeah. And like none of the other movies that came out this week, I think, are even like the top ten trends on Twitter. Sure. I mean, this so, movie yeah. is getting very good. Crazy. Yeah, for mouth. sure. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. As it should. I what I liked about it is uh, two things that I also think would have made it a good theater movie. The main thing being you don't really need to have seen any of the other movies yeah, to enjoy this. For, sure. for a series that is so obsessed, I think, with its lore. Not as much as some other series, no, but I, I Or do you think more I'll that make it's a more correction. fan thing? The fans okay, are the obsessed fans with it. <laughs> okay, sure. The movies don't really care. I think you could see any Predator movie without having seen the previous ones and you'd be fine. I I, I think that's safe to say with all all five plus the two AVPs, I think you could watch those without having seen anything. Honestly. Maybe. Yeah, because it is such a simple story of just, it's it's the most dangerous game, right? Yeah. It's just like, you're being hunted by a weird alien. Hope you don't get killed, you know? Yeah. Sure, it helps if you know, like, their honor code and what weapons they have <laughs> yeah. so that when you see the well, red like, dots, you, you can cheer. Their whatever, whole but. thing, too, is they, they're a species that just, they hunt for sport. Mm -hmm. And they travel the galaxy looking for new exciting species to go hunt. And they want to find worthy hunts is the thing. And that does come into play in this. And they do a good job of explaining or like kind of revealing the predator code almost where she kind of realizes, oh, I'm in a position where I'm not fun for him to hunt so he's leaving me alone i'm not seen as a threat right yeah, now yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah well that's it's so fun to me that that like the movie does such a great job of building like yeah like you said like the, the predator code what the code of honor is and also just her journey to you know becoming the threat that can destroy the predator yeah you know like uh just in, in pro wrestling terms they do such an effective <laughs> angle of like the predator is learning like how to like how to hunt and finding out who the ideal people to hunt on this planet because you know as they I believe the director has said in interviews that like this canonically is the first time that the predator has like been on Earth. Oh, I really? That, I know that in Alien versus Predator, there's you know they are, are significantly older, but I think that like that's kind of being considered non-canon, and mm -hmm. you know the comics do other stuff. But as far as just like the movies go, the canon is this is the predator's first hunt on Earth. So I think that that's why you see the predator in this film, like you know, kind of you could see them kind of like figuring out what the apex predator is. And, you know, like it starts with, you know, a snake and then like they fight a wolf and then they find, you know, like a uh, bear, you know, a bear mm -hmm. and then they, um, you know, scan the um, the Comanche tribal members and they see like the weapons and they're like, oh, we're pretty sure that's it. Yeah. And I didn't even make that connection yeah, that yeah. the the scans kind of move up the like the food. or like. The and even outside of that, the very first thing that we see is an ant crawling or not very first in the movie, but as far as the hierarchy of animals and uh, species go. We see an ant crawling on the invisible predator. A mouse eats that, and then a snake eats the mouse, oh, yeah, and then the predator kills the snake. Too, yep, show. there's a the wolf hunts the oh, rabbit. Yeah. So lots of uh, when we find the bear the first time it is eating another animal. So lots of indications of like these are the superior animals on the food chain and makes them worthy for the predator to hunt and kill. But I do like how yeah the predator itself uh, moves up incrementally until it's facing the people. Well, yeah, and then you get to that point. Um, which is like kind of mid late act two, where um, the predator is just massacring a bunch of French traders. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the, the main character played just an amazing role by Amber Mid Thunder mm -hmm. um, is you know the next scene also massacring a bunch of French fur traders. Yeah. And it's like oh they've hit their they've hit their like point of they're equals now like mm -hmm. you want to see that fight go down. Yeah. Oh my god, the French fur traders. I was <laughs> telling Joey before we started recording on my mom's side of the family, I'm French Canadian and I have a lot of fur traders and stuff in my in my lineage and so as soon as those fuckers showed up with their dumb hats i was like oh, so man, many dumb hats they're dude. all getting killed so fast <laughs> well it was i, I gotta say seeing this in a like in a theater full of native people dude, I, <laughs> when the french fur traders just started getting massacred by anybody just the crowd pop and applause was <laughs> deafening they are fodder there's so many of them yeah. getting murdered when something that was so cool about this movie is you know, like uh, the the historic like native representation in it. Um, like this is the first time in the history of major motion pictures that a movie's been led by a native woman. You know, yeah, um, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like and it had like a largely native. I mean, pretty much except for like, the French mm -hmm. fur traders and the mm -hmm. predator 
entirely native cast and crew. Um, special shout out to you know Amber Mid Thought and Thunder who plays the lead, Dakota Beavers who plays the brother, who were just phenomenal. They were actors. so good. Like yeah. Dakota Beaver is like this is his first acting first role, role right? Yeah, yeah. It's his first acting role, and um, you know I, I think that uh, and they really did a lot of uh, a lot of good behind the scenes in hiring like Jane Myers, who's a member of the Comanche Nation, to make sure that the Comanche representation was just on point. Like so much of the stuff was just really great as far as like you know their outfits even the colors that they used um you know on the like the clothing for the comanche people was like accurate to the colors available to the comanche people at the time oh, oh nice. what in terms yeah. of like what they would have had access the dyes to and yeah, like the dyes and yeah. stuff so like that cool. yeah and it's it's such a like you know it, it's a film that so much care went into the native representation that like jane myers the, the comanche producer on the film like you see a, a like a baby being carried on like a cradle board yeah. And like she made that with her own hands. Oh, mm. cool! So it's like you you see stuff like that, and like you know, uh, for me, just as like you know, like a native person who loves horror movies, this is the first time that I've seen a horror movie that's like, or I've seen I think really a movie that's a major motion picture that's come out in, uh, you know, like the, the, that's a period piece that where the native people aren't the cannon fodder. Right. So like mm -hmm. to see that where it's like the native people were the main characters and like these French fur traders were the cannon fodder, that was like after the premiere, a lot of the buzz is like, wow, like the native people were in this movie and they were like playing at the top of their intelligence, smart and cool. And also they weren't the cannon fodder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or the villains with like Bone Tomahawk. Yeah. Where yeah. I know that they try in that movie to differentiate uh, the the killers from like, I don't know, they do Other a little bit natives. of these ones are the good ones. Like, it's kind <laughs> yeah, of gross, I, yeah. You've seen that movie? Wait, which movie? Bone, Bone Tomahawk. Tomahawk. No, I don't think oh, I've Okay, seen it. yeah. I'd be it's, curious yeah. to see what you thought about it. It's, uh, it's, it's gruesome, but I don't know. A lot of people like it. Kind of rubbed me the wrong way a little bit. But yeah, it was, it's just such a it, it's such a refreshing movie to see. Like you know, I feel like I judge movies that focus on native characters kind of uh, two different ways. One is how is it as a movie, and two is is it racist? Yeah. <laughs> or like, just is the native representation good? You know, mm. and you know, I think oftentimes one kind of can affect the other if it's like so bad. And this is an example where like the native representation was phenomenal, and the movie was phenomenal, and like, you know, like the native representation being so spot on is like a big reason as to why it was so good outside of just you know, the, the amazing directing script and, like, acting in it, you know? Yeah, I think even just as a moviegoer, too, like, that extra level of immersion where stuff is so accurate and you can feel the love put into something like yeah. that. That just adds so much to the experience, and I just can't imagine why, you know, anyone would have issues with that. Like, when we did our uh, Indian Burial Grounds episode, we were talking about how because a lot of those movies, native characters are kind of these invisible, like yeah. characters that existed in the past yeah. and are kind of in the subtext almost. And it's like, it'd be nice to just see native people as main characters. <laughs> and mm -hmm. this this is a or movie just, that does just, that. Or just to see native people, period. Yeah, just showing <laughs> up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it does that. And it's like, and it's also just a great movie. Yeah, like, you and, know. And th that's the thing that I think is so cool is like this movie just kicks ass. This yeah. isn't like a movie that is, you know, I think people maybe face value who are weird about, the, or like pissed and look at this movie and it's like, oh, it's starring a woman, like a not white woman with this woke predator bullshit. It's like, like people, everyone just wants a chance to kick ass. Like yeah. it's not about like being preachy or it's just as cool. Well, that's, that's something that like is so, cool to me in seeing, you know, like movies like Prey and like, you know, the increased native representation we've been seeing on TV with shows like, you know, Reservation Dogs and Rutherford Falls coming out is like, I, like, I'm so excited for native kids to see this movie, to see like a native wo woman just like massacring a predator. Yeah. <laughs> and like playing at the top of her intelligence and just being like an intelligent, cool, good character. Cause like, that's just not something that we've seen very often in features of just like, you know, that kind of just positive native representation you know? yeah even the family dynamics in yeah. this too are like classic older brother younger sister like they both kind of poke at each other and he just feels like you can tell he's written to be such a specific age where it's like this is a very young man who clearly yeah. thinks he is maybe more mature than he actually yeah, is sure, and sure. it's so classic and like all you know his friends aren't perfect either you know they're oh, just they they're, no, they're, 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 they're shit they're yeah, yeah, like yeah. as you don't get writing in this that does like the noble savage kind of trope where it's making them like 
Where it's like romanticizing them yeah. unnecessarily, I think. But yeah, well, that's something that I really loved about like, like I've said it a couple times, but it's like all the native characters really played everything at the top of their intelligence. Like if this was a different movie, the predator would show up and they would be like, clearly this is our new God, you know, or whatever. Sure, yeah. And it's like, no, it's like they just recognize this is something that's like on their territory that's dangerous. And yeah. Like, and the Amberman Thunder character wants to take it out. And I like, think she even, they, they kind of even like, address that trope yeah. even because she says I forget what creature she thinks it is at first and they're like that's a story for children like yeah it's like about? That, yeah it's like it's not the boogeyman the you know? mupizzo yeah uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right but I'm assuming it, so I, I'm actually curious about the director saying that this is the canonically the first time that Predator's been to Earth because the movie begins with a voiceover from her saying a long time ago a monster came here and then because of that and the fact that they have these stories where it's apparently about a monster that re the predator reminds her of i'd assume that a uh, predator had visited earth in the past sometime and that that tale had been passed down through the generation so like i think that that to me feeds into just like the cool the indigenous storytelling that they're leaning into in you know in telling the story in that like you know, we don't know when she's saying that voiceover. Mm -hmm. Like, she could be saying that 50 years in the future, referring to, like, this is how we got this crazy legend, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the other thing I really like is just her development of a character. Yeah. Uh, I, I Remarkably, remarkably, stupidly, I have seen some people, the types that you would expect to complain online, she's call her, too like, a Mary smart Sue. right away. Where it's like, oh, we literally F watch her develop these skills, go from, like struggling to get a rabbit and a deer to figure like having yeah. her cool little uh hatchet on a string trick and like yeah. getting rabbits Everyone... falling into the mud but... using that later to like get the predator it's it's great well, it's... i guess that to, to me the, uh, two points on that one she is for sure not a mary sue yeah, character not, no and way. two <laughs> native people deserve our own mary sue characters too <laughs> sure, yeah. like if it's if she is a mary sue character this is the first time native people have ever had a mary <laughs> <Yeah>. sue character <laughs> right. and like we we should get to have mary sue characters too right not, you know she's absolutely not that she's a yeah. well-developed <laughs> character and like that's what like yeah like if you if you think that she's a mary sue you did not watch the first hour of the movie mm -hmm. where she's developing these skills and like these skills aren't totally coming out of nowhere. It's clear she's using knowledge that she already has. I mean, with, you know, for example, the, like, the, the orange petaled flower and stuff like that that, like, cools her blood so that she can turn yeah. invisible for the predator. It's great. It's like, you know, the, and these are all things that I, I think that they also do a really great job of fleshing out, like, the, the members of the Comanche Nation outside of, like, her, one of her brother's friends gets mauled by the cougar. Like, uh, her brother's friends immediately make, you know, like a, like a, like a stretcher, yeah, make a stretcher mm -hmm. for him. Um, you see shots of people just brushing their teeth, like because that's a thing that humans have done for hundreds of years. You know? Yeah, I liked and, all the hand tools in this, or she like strips, uh, yeah. like bark, and she kind of weaves a rope, which is when she makes like the hatchet on the. I just I liked all that stuff a yeah, lot. It's clear that like it's very clear that she's a capable character with all of the pieces at the start of the movie. It's just the movie is her putting those pieces together. You yeah, know? yeah. And get, gaining the experience necessary to uh, implement them in a way that can take down a predator. Yeah. And, it, and it's also so cool to me to, I mean, you, you talked earlier about like, you know, like, oh, like a like a, a non-white woman is the lead in a movie, you know? But something that I love about this is that um, it uses like, you know, it uses a lot of like Comanche lore and traditions as like a jumping off point to tell the story. Like, um, I, like I'm probably gonna butcher the pronunciation on this, but the, um, Kutamea, which oh, is, yeah. um, that's one of the movie posters instead of Prey, it says Kutamea. Oh. That means uh, rite of passage in Comanche. So like this is her specific Comanche rite of passage story. And like, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not Comanche, so I can't necessarily speak to like if there's a specific Comanche rite of passage in hunting something that hunts people. Mm -hmm. But the Comanche for sure had a rite of passage ceremony. So to use that as like her reasoning to fight the predator is like, cool as hell you yeah because that's the whole thing with the predator too their lore is what i think in the first movie isn't it specifically it's a first hunt kind of thing for you don't get any of that you don't get in, in that first, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. first movie but the comics i think yeah go through it uh because it's uh is it a blooded yaocha is that what's called when you do the the hunt i, I there's so much lore to <laughs> predators uh which is remarkable that it all came out of a 
commando style movie starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, they've really built it up. But yeah, it, it is a very similar thing where these haunts are the predators' rites of passage. It's like so. such a perfect fit. I can't believe, like, it, it's so crazy that now is when we're getting this, because to me that idea just makes total sense, like this canonical creature where their culture has this rite of passage first hunt, and, like, combining that with a culture that actually exists where that is a real rite of, like, that's such a cool thing! Yeah, well, and I think that, like, that's not, that's, that's not something that you would have gotten if, if they had not had such a great and vast like native team behind the scenes who are like able to help steer things like um dan trachtenberg amazing director loved 10 cloverfield lane yeah um he's not native but he like and he also co-wrote it but he like is aware that he's not native so he reached out to like the right people like i mentioned jane myers and a lot of other people behind the scenes to just like make sure that that's accurate and they could find like a core of something in like actual comanche you know traditions to base this like really cool fleshed out thing that like you know, like I said, like becomes just a perfect res- wrestling angle of like, it's her rite of passage and it's also the Predator's rite of passage who's going to win, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was so curious how, like, the production of this movie, I remember when they kind of announced the the premise and that he was directing. And I remember thinking like, oh, it's weird that they're not having someone who's native direct this. But I didn't realize until like, you know, it came out this week that there was such a, you know, on the production team that there, that there's so much, um, you know, like it was so collaborative and I love that you can tell this is a really collaborative movie because films are collaborative. I, I kind of like that. I, I feel like we're maybe starting to move past the idea of the director as the all powerful God of a film. Um, cause when you think about it, the director's job isn't to be making every single choice or to be to have the movie be entirely their story. It's like no, it's to pick the people who you're will, coordinating. Yeah, you're 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 making sure all the moving pieces kind of fall into place, and you're helping you're, you're helping you're kind of guiding actors and making sure all the actors feel like they're in the same movie. I think that's a big <laughs> part of directing too. Is if someone's you know, someone's idea is like, oh, this is like a horror comedy and you've got someone else playing it like it's a straight up, you know, like a drama or something. That's also part of the director's um, job, too. I thought it was to wear weird puffy pants and shout into a megaphone that has director written on it. Yes, the <laughs> big, like, where yeah, the, yeah, like, yeah. the thighs kind of pop out, like, triangles. very comfortable looking pants. <laughs> For sure, yes. Um, yeah, well, when I think that that's, like, this to me, this movie is the, like, the bar of what you need to do if you're making a movie with a, a native lead and about native characters like you know like the director is not native but he hired just like a lot of native people on the team and like listen to everybody yeah i feel like uh, up until this point what you often saw in hollywood if you saw a movie um you know uh about native characters but not you know written by or directing native people is like they would have maybe one native consultant who like Basically, they would just be looking for the like, hey, tell us it's not racist. Yeah, yeah. this is okay, right? Yeah, and then if the <laughs> and then if the native person would say, no, it's not, they would be like, oh, we didn't read that email. Sorry, you know, like yeah. So th- this is clearly a situation where like the director like really listened to like the native crew, and he also like understood. Like I, I heard that they had like a lot of interns on set who were like native people. Um, to basically like work in every department and like learn and kind of get their foot oh, in the great. That's awesome. industry. So it's like understanding that you're telling this story like about native people with a native cast and with native people behind the scenes but also realizing that like oh you kind of have a responsibility if you're telling a native story to also give opportunities to up and coming native people in the entertainment industry mm-hmm. give them the experience that they'll need to yeah. Yeah. carry on and i mean and... that what a kick-ass movie to have on a resume too like yeah. Yeah, i worked on prey and yeah just think of the did you see antlers or no no i just wanted to see it i think they had like a native consultant on it and there's like some weird uh i i appreciate that antlers depicts um the the rural poverty that it does but it does so using the wendigo which is you know not really the uh their lore to tell i think it was like a we had a native consultant on this and they also had like the one native character slash actor show up do the exposition and then we don't that's right yeah they definitely showed up to to explain things was it the dad from twilight it's wild to look at the difference between that and this and I think, you know, aside from Prey being a much better movie, For it's sure. just you feel that care. It's like this kind of intangible thing that you just feel while you're watching it, and it's awesome. And, and it's, I feel like it's it's rare for 
a major motion picture with native characters to come out and to have like native Twitter not be ready to like dunk on it. You know? <laughs> yeah. And like this is something where like, you know, I feel like once word got out, the amount of work that they put into the native representation side of it, like Indian country was stoked. And you're seeing so many like, you know, reactions on Twitter from natives and non-natives that are just like stoked as hell that this movie exists and is so good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And just the fact that in general, it's a fucking good movie. It's yeah. always fun it's when- also, also a great movie. It just movie. also yeah. kicks ass. And like, it's always a good time when horror Twitter, when a horror movie comes out and everyone, like 90% of people love it. It's just like we're all holding hands in a circle. We're just yeah. like, this is the best. This movie is cool. Yeah, lots of people saying this is their favorite Predator movie since the original. Uh, I think, you know, looking back, I think the Predator series is actually a pretty strong one. I kind of like it. But, Each in their own very unique ways. The thing is, uh, is most horror series get really <laughs> stupid and bad. And so the bar is low. <laughs> but I think Predator is one of the more fun ones. Yeah, and you know, when I covered them on the Kill Count, it was early on in the channel, and I, I hate how sometimes back then I would hear that a movie was a certain way and incorporate that into my feel. So when I covered Predator 2, I was like, this movie is a bad movie, but it's kind of, but like, I Wrong. bet I would fucking love Predator 2 like if Predator we watched it right too. now. Have, have you watched it any sort of recently or? Um, yeah, yeah, I, um, I, so um, I watched the Comanche dub of Prey. Oh, that's such a night. cool thing. It, that's also first, for sure, the first major motion picture to ever be released in Comanche. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that, that's that's another thing that's just like it really speaks to the work that the director put into, and this is what got the producer Jane Myers interested in working on it. Is she read the script for it, and like I think the first line at the top of the script was, "This is entirely in Comanche." Yeah, <laughs> and she was like, "Oh, you want to make a good movie? Cool." <laughs> yeah. Um, and then at what point was that decision made to have them be speaking English most of the time? So um, they, they uh, my guess is that was probably like a, a studio Maybe a decision studio that thing, was yeah. just like that was just like yeah, it's cool that it's all in Comanche, but but uh, you know English would probably you know do better. But they they have a you can like watch the movie fully in Comanche. They have a dub entirely in Comanche that's on Hulu. That the like the entire cast of this movie provided that translation. So it is the same actors doing those yeah. lines. Okay, yeah, it's like Anna I wasn't Thutter, sure if they all Beavers, all of them doing Comanche because uh, I had heard that not too many people speak that language fluently now. Uh, yeah, that's one thing I read. That, that's the case of a lot of um, native languages. Um, is that like there are um, like 574 federally recognized tribes, 100 more, hundreds more at the state level, and they all have their own kind of cultures, languages, and things like that. But um, you know, like due to uh, you know colonization, a lot of these languages um, have been lost or are just you know like tougher to you know tougher to come by, specifically like um, like fluent speakers. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's like doubly so in that a lot of tribal languages are passed down orally. Yeah. So um, you know, passed down you know generation generationally through families, and there's not necessarily like a dictionary. Like dictionaries, available. yeah. Like for mm -hmm. my tribe, I'm uh, enrolled Cowlitz. Like we have a Cowlitz dictionary, but you have to like be a tribal member to buy it. Like okay. you have to like show your tribal ID card and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I think that with this, um, like something that Jane Myers had to do, the, um, the Comanche producer on the film, is she like literally went to her relatives and was like, how do I say this word oh, Comanche? Okay. Um, you know, so... And then I'm assuming the actors would have had to learn that directly because uh, I don't believe all of them are no, Comanche. I think, it, the main, I think the lead is she's Sue. Yeah, she's Sue, and um, I don't. I'm not sure if there are any Comanche actors in it. I know that um, Amber Mid Thunder is. Um, she's part uh, Nakota, which um, the Stony Nakota um, land in Canada is where they shot the movie. Mm. And so, uh, what is Alberta? Alberta. Yeah, yeah, Alberta. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you know that there are definitely connections to the areas that they shot it, but I'm not sure if any actors in the film are Comanche. Okay. I'm so. I just realized I don't know much about like the just like the linguistics of native languages like if you're so I, for example i think of like we have germanic languages right where i i speak kind of german and some of it it's like oh you can clearly tell what this word means because it's we clearly kind of got it from you know older germanic languages right. and it's this parallel so i'm wondering like if wouldn't learning Comanche, if you already know another native language, is it a similar situation or are they totally well, different like Spanish families? and Portuguese? Yeah, where it's like, like oh, similar that, families familiar. and it's like, it's not like, yeah, the romantic languages are the easiest ones for English speakers to learn mm -hmm. because there's like some, you know, sort of at least structural similarity, the like syntax and stuff. 
I don't know. I'm so just curious. It's all kind of regional based. Like the differences from one culture and one language from another could be the, as big as the differences between English and like, you know, the languages spoken in Egypt and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But like, you know, I, I can only speak from, you know, my tribe's experience, but um, like my tribe is, um, I'm Cowlitz, which is like a coastal Salish tribe, which is basically Pacific Northwest into kind of South uh, Western Canada. And, um, you know, there's definitely like a lot of tribes in that ling language that share Coastal Salish as kind of like a trade language. And I'm sure there are probably some linguistic similarities, but it's like, I'm sure my tribe being in Washington state and the Comanche, which are based out of kind of like Southern Plains, like, you know, nowadays, Oklahoma, Texas and stuff like that. It's like, I'm, I'm sure there's no differences in like the linguistics between our tribes, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, you can, you can, it, it's, and sometimes it's not even specifically like locational. Like there are, there are some tribes that might be close together in a state or a section of the country that, you know, do share kind of like core words and sounds and stuff like that. But then you might go 50 miles north and there's a tribe that's like completely disconnected from that. Yeah, that's so, I just think language is so interesting. I could just, I don't want to derail this too hard because I could just get super nerdy about like how languages evolve and like. <laughs> <laughs> when it's like, it is a very, I guess that for me, it's like there's a, you know, there's, there's a history of colonization in this country where like part of um, like part of like, you know, just like the attempted genocide of native people for lack of a better term was trying to destroy the culture. Yeah. So it was like, I mean, there's there's, you know, definitely for a point in the United States, it was like illegal to speak native languages and do your native practices and stuff like that. So to go from like that to, you know, where Comanche is a language without probably a ton of like, you know, hugely fluent speakers to them having a major motion picture in Comanche that like anybody in the world can watch is yeah. like cool That's as hell. Cool yeah, as hell. that is such a neat, I think, yeah, maybe an underrated like part of why this movie is cool is I think that's gonna be, you know, at least some sort of aid in language preservation is just having yeah. this dub right? track where it's like conversations between people and it's a story and it's, because you think about the the way that, you know, like you said, we we, uh, like spoken word or like passing a language down through speech specifically and also just the easiest way to learn a language is immersion and when you've right. had languages literally outlawed for years at a time it's like you just lose you know it's it's crazy how easy it is to just lose an entire language like that I, I didn't even think about that just how you know timeline speaking how nuts it is that so recently yeah some of these languages were straight up illegal to speak yeah yeah oh yeah i mean that's uh, like i you know i don't know exactly you know when um these things were renewed but it's like or when these things were like made not illegal to speak mm -hmm. but like you know i, I know like i mean I, like I'm, I'm sure it was as recent as like the 70s or something yeah. you know it was definitely within at the very least our parents lifetimes yeah. you know mm -hmm. And, um, and, and there is also like another side to this of um, the importance of language revitalization is for like kids to be interested in learning the language. Like you've got to have somebody that, that, that like wants to have this passed down to them. So like, you know, this movie being entire, like having a dub entirely in Comanche, if that shows like native kids who are Comanche or part of other, you know, tribal nations to like want to listen to their elders to learn their language because like, you know, people are speaking Comanche in the latest Predator movie. Yeah. yeah. That's just like, I don't know. It's just, it's... Like encouraging generational ties and yeah, yeah connection and how, like, back cool to this your... Just making it cool, yeah. It's just cool. It's cool that somebody speaking Comanche murdered the effing Predator. Yeah, <laughs> right. Oh, man. more. We should encourage more areas of, of study and connection uh, to our our roots by just like slapping a predator in there you know yeah, get the yeah, kids yeah. interested in learning just put a predator in yeah it. it's a predator it's just like everybody should have health insurance <laughs> exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, click, click, click 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 yeah the top one percent of the top one percent <laughs> yeah um i like that i had this really heartfelt talk about uh root and language revitalization while wearing this very fun hat. it's good yeah <laughs> Hey, want to talk to you about our first sponsor this week, Shudder. Shudder has by far the best selection of horror films streaming anywhere online, and they're always streaming uncut and commercial free. If you still haven't checked out Mad God, please do so so you can listen to our episode about it. It's the stop motion epic masterpiece from visual effects legend Phil Tippett, known for films like Jurassic Park and Return of the Jedi. It's an absolutely wild ride, I promise you may be 
won't regret it. Also newly added are two movies I want to check out, Alligator and Alligator 2. You know I love a good creature feature, and this is the first time either of those two movies are available for streaming. They're also scanned from new prints obtained from the original camera negative, so they're gonna look great. You can stream all this and more from Shudder's ever-growing library of horror and thrillers ad-free for just $5.99 a month. Shudder has everything supernatural, thriller, and horror. I can't get enough of it. You're gonna love it too. And right now, you can stream your first 30 days of Shudder for free. Go to Shudder.com and use code DEADMEAT. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R dot com code DEADMEAT. Stream free for your first 30 days by going to Shudder.com code DEADMEAT. Our next sponsor this week is Surfshark. Online protection? Who needs it? If you're asking this question, obviously you do. Websites, hackers, and third-party companies all monitor your online behavior. Even your internet service provider can monitor and sell your online behavior to other third parties. In short, you explore and do your thing online and they profit off of it unless you have a VPN. This easy to use product can help you prevent all of what I just said. It masks your location and makes it more difficult to distinguish you from a crowd of users. And it doesn't end there. Let's pretend you would like to have even more security than that. In that case, Surfshark also has your back. They have an awesome product called Surfshark Alert, which alerts you every time your personal data has been leaked online, and Surfshark Search, which you can use as a search engine without any tracking or targeted ads. You can try Surfshark risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deals deadmeat. Enter the promo code DEADMEAT for 83% off and three extra months free. That's surfshark.deal slash deadmeat. But yeah, so it's like, I, I appreciate this film. I mean, for me, like, like I, I just watched the, um, the first Predator movie right before this just to kind of catch up on it. And, you know, this is for sure the best Predator movie since the first Predator. And, like, I mean, maybe I mean, it's like, oh, maybe as good as the first Predator, you know? Yeah, I mean, they all offer very different things. For sure, for sure. Uh, the first Predator movie, I was like, eh, on. And then I learned about how they actually went into that jungle and, like, shot a movie in that jungle. And I was like, all right, that's kind of fucking cool. Uh, the second one is just so buck wild and right. ridiculous that I it, it's hard to hate like the predator talking to a little kid and being like learning how to say want some candy yeah, <laughs> I forgot about that. uh oh. third one with a, a bunch of people being hunted on a different uh different planet and adrian brody's there and who's the fucking doctor who ends up being bad is it it's not elijah wood it's is it toby mcguire i think so yeah it's like a weird and then the fourth one i mean maybe there's not so much to love there but <laughs> <laughs> that one's weird Did you see yeah. that with the... i so i've seen all of them except for the fourth one okay uh which uh i hear it's like technically a reboot so it's like canonically you don't necessarily need to watch it <laughs> it's a mess i don't know they haven't there's a big plot point with an autistic kid being, i heard about this oh, yeah, yeah being like considered like the next step of like human evolution or something I don't know. It's it's tonally all over the place. <sighs> Wait, which one's the one with the lady that is definitely gonna fuck that predator? So that's the first a Alien versus Predator. Yeah, that's have an you Ali seen thing. that? Oh yeah, yeah, that in was in Antarctica. Fun. That's fun. I ship it. And then the second Alien versus Predator is pretty bad, but it's got a lot of cool gore and kind of fun stuff. So like again, all these movies offer something, but I think as far as like. Being a, I think you said focused before we started filming. Like this is a focused film that knows what it wants to do and like is very honed in on what it wants to be. I think it is uh, maybe the most successful or, you know, alongside that original one. I feel like it definitely stands alongside. It just depends. Like, I feel like the flow charts, like how greasy looking do you want your muscles? To look? <laughs> and if you want like some greasy boys, just watch that first one. And if you don't want everyone looking so like Vaseline up, praise good. Yeah, that was something that like the, and there's the iconic shot of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Carl Weathers <laughs> yeah. that, where it's like, oh, there's they, they for sure wiped a bunch of Vaseline on their yeah, muscles before. Yeah, yeah. This um, one, the tone is like just totally different, which is great. It doesn't need to be that first but, one. Although so, that would also be a fun choice. Something that I thought was really cool about this, going back and watching the first Predator, is like there are a lot of um, implied connections between the two movies. Mm -hmm. um, like for one, the first Predator features, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Du Bois, 
like <laughs> you know going and invading you know a different country and fighting people on their aboriginal land whereas this is about people on their aboriginal land where like oh, yeah. where like the predators as the predators as well as the fur trappers are the invaders so mm -hmm. it's like a cool inverse there are also like other just interesting things like the first shot that you see of Arnold Schwarzenegger in the first Predator, he's smoking a cigar. Mm -hmm. And then And that's an indication yeah. of the villains in this one. Yeah, it's yeah. the indication of the villains in this one, which like mm -hmm. I'm really curious about like, oh, is that an intended move of like this is kind of in, this is the opposite of the first predator. They, they could have used any object to indicate I think the cigar was it, it made me think of Arnold pointed, right away because, yeah. like, he's he's a cigar guy. Like, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. his thing. Well, there's another parallel in that the original movie does have a native character, Billy. Yeah. Uh, I forget is the actor uh, native. So I I did some research into this. It's um, he uh, is of native descent, but I do not. I think that he's like Cherokee in another tribe. I'm not sure if he's like an enrolled member of a tribe. Okay. Like, I'm not sure if it's like a biological or if he's like a tribal member sure. like that's always you know kind of a, a i'm sure yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but um, he he like cuts his own chest yeah he cuts his own chest before and, fighting the predator yeah and in and then, this movie yeah and the dakota beavers character has somebody else cut his chest yeah to like act as bait mm -hmm. I mean, in both situations it's like a baiting situation yeah. but it's like the exact same the exact same cut. diagonal cut you know mm -hmm. Oh, man. Yeah, a lot of parallels. And then, of course, the tie-in to the second Predator with the exact same flintlock yeah, pistol. I did the Leo point at the screen. Uh, like, yeah. I, just, I know that. I recognize that. Which is interesting because the Predator... The Predators, I guess, have it at the end of Predator 2. And they do they give it to Danny Glover as like a gift for... Yeah, they, they one know? of them th says take it and then mm -hmm. throws it to Danny Glover. And there's a pointed close-up of it. Yeah, and it's, it's the a, exact same... Yeah, it's a, both of them say Raphael Adelini, 1715. And is Raphael the the name of the translator in this movie, I think, the, with the curly mustache? So, um, it, uh, I'm not sure if they established that in the film... In the comics, Raphael Adelini is like a, he's like a pirate. Oh, that's right. And, he is a pirate in the And comics. I think that this takes place in 1716, so this is one year beforehand, I believe. Or this is one year after. Uh, this takes place in 1719. Oh, got it. Yeah, so it's yeah. a few years. Got it, got it, mm -hmm. got it. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the conversation is like, is like, presumably the pirate Raphael Adelini is no longer canon, so it's probably that fur trapper or something Yeah, because like I think that. the subtitle said Raphael when he's like, oh, help me, like and he's missing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Or yeah. is that a different character? What? Rambert? No, I think it was Raphael because he is also the one who gives her the gun and tells her how to yeah. use it. Because when he has it, he's like, shows up missing a foot. Th by the way, that, uh, that character, awesome. Uh, play dead acting when he realizes <laughs> oh, that geez. the predator's in his camp. He like throws himself onto his back, and then I think ballsy move decides to play dead eyes open. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. if I'm playing dead, I'm I'm probably gonna close my eyes. But he yeah, decides no. still get in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, he's like, no, I'll I'll just fucking hold him open. I was a little sad that uh, he didn't make it, but you know what? He was still there doing his thing. So it was yeah, gonna happen. <laughs> I am so curious. Like I. Um, hadn't seen Predator 2 in a while when I saw Prey, so I didn't catch the reference. Mm -hmm. And then um, just like last night watching the Comanche Dub, a friend pointed that out. And I, of course, went down the rabbit hole, watched, you know, like watched the last act of Predator 2, the first Predator movie, and just really dove into the lore. And now I'm so interested to see a sequel to Prey. Yes, because yeah, how... They set it up. Does, how the yeah, exactly. Because in the end of Predator Two, the That's predators have the gun, about. but she has it in the end of Prey. And I was there is, very concerned about it. The end credits do have like an animated sequence showing the story of the movie, and it ends with the Yautja returning, yeah, and it looking uh, kind of menacing. So I don't know if they're going to do a direct sequel to Prey. I'm sure it, I'd be into it. When uh, shout out to that, I, I believe that that sequence was made by Kaz Kip, who's a really dope native um, producer artist. Oh, cool. Um, and um, the, something just the, the the level of authenticity that they went for in the movie is that like that is specifically um, drawings on animal hides that is traditional to how the Comanche did a lot of their art in the 1700s. So like, even so that cool. was accurate. And yeah, the uh, yeah that end credit sequence basically tells the story of the movie. Um, the second to last shot is you know like she returns with the predator head. You know mm -hmm. she killed the predator, and then the next one is yeah the predator ships show up. But presumably, you've got to think that, you know, if Predator 2, we've established that if you kill a predator, the other predators, like, you know, they understand that you, like... You, you're the winner. Yeah, you're the, yeah. you won. You, you get won. the belt. You won the tournament. Alone. You get yeah. the belt. Yeah. yeah, you're the champion. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, like, there is apparently in the comics a character that's really similar to Amber Midthunder's character that, um, like, she basically 
the predators come visit her mm -hmm. they take her back to like the predator planet yeah and then they basically just teach her to hunt with them yeah oh i read God. that first uh the first alien versus predator like comic collection i remember that character yeah, yeah and it's like oh if that's i mean so there are two ways they could go with the sequel one is that the the predators show up you know they take her back to the home planet she hunts with them and then you know she gives them the pistol as a sign of respect and then they give it to danny glover's character as sort of a like okay we got this from the last cool human that we met you're the next coolest human we met here you go yeah or there's a world where the predators show up and then they just team up and fight colonialism that'd be pretty <laughs> sick too yeah it's just like I, machiko yeah. noguchi was the name right. of uh, the character and yeah she she was blooded which is when a predator succeeds in their hunt so i kind right. of almost would think like it'd be fun if they they show back up and they were like yo you kicked the shit out of us like teach us all you and they do yeah, yeah. like an information exchange and yeah. on planet earth like i just want to see an alternate history where like andrew jackson's about to sign the indian removal act in the white house <laughs> yeah. and then the, and the three predator lasers, dots yeah. appear on his hand <laughs> and then it's just like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing is this movie has a different looking predator than the yeah, other ones. They all yeah. kind of vary. Cool. Uh, but apparently I've read, and this is just from people on the, I think, LV421 subreddit, the <laughs> like alien, but also you're going to have predator fans there, obviously. But they were saying that this is a different like race of predators, a different like subspecies, because it, he, without his mask, he does look different than the other predators. Oh, does he? Yeah, a little bit. I yeah. believe that there are, this is, um, I think, Alien versus Predator. There's two different types of predators. There are like the smaller ones that tend to work in groups, and there's the bulkier ones that tend to fight alone. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is one of the bulky ones that like, the kind of the bigger ones. Yeah. Oh, no, I think it's actually one of the smaller ones based on the actor who played him not hitting seven feet like some of the other ones, or maybe... It's yeah. different. I don't know. But yeah, it's different. And then his his mask is like, when he first revealed it, it almost looks like bone. Uh, we thought it was really cool that his weapons seem m less technologically advanced than in some of the other movies. And, you know, it's, it's one of those fun things to just wonder, have the Predators not reached those stages in technology? Then again, they're flying around in a spaceship, so maybe they are just tailoring the level of their weaponry to the... Uh, people they're like going to the be hunting period it's like oh these people in. don't have we, we shouldn't use our like laser pointer gun here because they're they're a lot of them are using like bow and arrows and yeah. spears i think that that's an honor code thing where yeah. like they have like they have the laser cannons for sure yeah. they just only use them if the person they're fighting has like a machine gun exactly <laughs> like, yeah you know it's like i think it's i think it's an honor code thing more than a, them not having a technology thing because like the <laughs> the so, mask because they still have like they still the, have the three eye dots they yeah, still that's have, the thing they, they they're like, like a spear they, they they're just going the camo, down the checklist you know. like we can use the spears we can't use the gun We'll still use the lasers, though. Yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> the laser guy we thing we'll those. use. But I like how, yeah, because at first he shows up and he's got like a bone-looking mask. I'm like, oh, is it is it just bone? But no, that thing still deflects bullets back into someone's head if they shoot yeah. it. Yeah. Point Hell point. yeah. So also, sick. huge crowd please in a room full of niggas. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I love that it, uh, it uses the net after they throw a net on him and oh. they think that they've captured it and then he uses his net and it like contracts. Oh yeah, the yeah. razor net was one of my favorite They're kills in that movie. They're all fucking Brutal. Gulliver's Travels fucking Predator, <laughs> yeah. dude. He, he oh, fucking man. uses his like, I forgot the name of the claws, his fucking Wolverine claws to go through a guy's head and then throws that guy's <laughs> body to stab another dude with the claw. There are so many cool kills yeah, in this fucking well, movie. Well, there's also like Dakota Beavers when he's fighting the Predator and he like shoots the Predator with an arrow and then runs up, grabs the arrow out of the Predator mm, and, and then, then shoots him again it, Yeah, <laughs> and I think that, I don't even know if that's before or after he leaps off his horse and yeah. fucking stabs yeah, him with a spear. Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's, yeah, and like the Amber Mid Thunder just like shooting the Predator point blank in the back of the head with a musket pistol. <laughs> And then oh just stealing God. his mask. Yeah, like, this it's just out. like yeah, it's just the action in this movie was just like coolest. It's really like good. I mean, like Ten Cloverfield Lane is for sure my favorite Cloverfield movie. Oh yeah, it's so good. And I didn't I didn't know that the director of Ten Cloverfield Lane had that level of action directing mm. in him. And They're very different movies because that one's all about the the tension building. Yeah, it's like a slow boil between a very small cast, very confined space, yeah. and then here we're outside. We got a much larger oh my God, cast. It looks amazing. This movie. This looks movie looks fucking so good. phenomenal. That's, I mean, that's one of the re one of the reasons I'm so disappointed that they're not doing like at least like a limited theatrical yeah. run. Yeah, is I would love looks, to see this, this on looks a big beautiful screen. on a big yeah. screen. And there are so many shots that just like look like paintings. Like, yeah. like 
like um, Amber Mid Thunder's character running and jumping off of that tree with her hatchet to like jump on the predator. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, like, she's like way high up. Yeah, yeah. And that left. just like yeah. that shot is like a painting, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a really cool overhead shot when she's in the tree, I think, with the uh waiting for the lion. Yeah, where it's like, like her and around. the lion. And then there's like her and the lion that are like on opposite sides of the tree. That's just like amazing cinematography. Yeah, yeah. and the, the cinematographer is Jeff Cutter, who uh also shot Ten Cloverfield Lane, as well as a little 2009 movie called Orphan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Orphan fucking rules. We love Orphan in this house. We do. <laughs> love Orphan. I, what I like about about Prey is how it just it looks so misty too. There's like yeah. all the it's like everything feels really dewy and like all the light diffusion is so pretty. It just and like the colors look so and, good. And all the landscape shots, which the huge, yeah, you can tell oh they shot God. on location, not oh yeah, for on sure, a sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And like I mean, we haven't even talked about the dog yet. I know. I was about oh to say we have to talk about the dog. The dog is uh, so cute. Sorry, Coco, played by Coco. Oh. oh yeah. Who apparently was uh, not. It, it, this is not an actor dog. They adopted this dog was adopted the dog for the movie to be in this movie because it is uh, a Carolina dog, uh, also known as the American Dingo, and it is a a breed of dog that, that predated been... Europeans. Yeah. Come, yeah. So like, uh, I'm assuming like natives in the Americas would have had these dogs. And yeah, with I mean, them. I just love that like. Coco, it just feels like such a res dog. I'm just like, oh, this is a dog that's like barely, like it's like barely contained. Yeah. It's gonna do whatever it wants. You yeah, know? It's such it just a... hangs out with us, kind of feeling. Yeah, I love. I think it was the director who was like, people are like, you, we want to see more, more of the, the dog. dog. We used every frame yeah, every possible single of that frame dog that the dog behaving. wasn't like biting the camera. Yeah, or yeah. Or just doing what it wants. I, I mean, I can't believe they were able to accomplish what they did with just a dog they adopted. That dog does a lot in this movie. Yeah. It's like looking back and forth when she's practicing the hatchet on the string. Brings her a little like mouse or something. That's so cute. That's so cute. So cute. (laughs) Earlier she fed the dog some like some rabbit or something. Yeah. It brings her food back. Oh, it's so cute. And you know, obviously add some stakes because that whole fucking movie you're like they best not kill this dog I know the brother's gonna die I've come to accept that he's really cool but I get it as soon as they introduced the brother we both were like R.I.P. dude or so (laughs) bad I'm so sorry but his death he died a cool death It's, it's sick it's very cool like he, I mean, he puts up a hell of a fucking fight. There's also, yeah, like, I want to talk more about, like, I, like watching it again, I wanted to pick up all the details of the uh, Amber Mint Thunder Predator fight. She literally rips off one of the Predator's mandibles yes! and stabs him with yeah, it. Yeah, it's after she wedges herself beneath a rock to yeah, with, like, not the, get the, decapitated. Yeah, with, like, the so knife shield care. or whatever. Yeah, because it, it's like a shield that fans out from, like, it's like a radial shield, and he uses it earlier to fucking decapitate a guy and cut down a tree at once. Yeah, yeah. And even does, like, a Michael Myers head tilt after yeah, yeah. he does it. So she sees that coming and gets underneath a rock, and then I love the the uh, showcase of its power as it's cutting through the rock, too. Yeah, it's, like, sparking and well, she, stuff. She also yeah. uses, like, her awareness of the shield to, like, slice the predator's own arm up. Yeah, like, she, she pulls it out, and she's just, like, uh, like, kicks it so that it hits him in the arm. Yeah, yeah, she, like, I, I think she, like, goes to to strike him and forces him to deflect with that shield and then cut off his own arm while it's stuck in the tree. It's so cool. She's such yeah. like a, a character where when I think of final girls and why final girls are really effective or why like female leads in horror movies specifically are really effective is like compared to, you know, you think of the first Predator where like that's a bunch of muscly dudes. Yeah. And, like there is the fear there, but it's Arnold Schwartz. You're not as, as cons- you know, you don't feel as... You're not, it's not as relatable to watch characters like that. It's a different viewing experience entirely. Yeah. Whereas a final girl, because this kind of character like we were talking about and why you know she is she does not qualify as like a Mary Sue, for example. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She is just using stuff around her and like you can just see the gears turning the whole yeah. movie. Mm-hmm. And like that's so fun to live through that while you're watching because realistically 99% of us watching a Predator movie, we're going to be, you know, trying to make the best of, like, what's around us versus, like, we're built like Arnold Schwarzenegger trying to survive, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, like, she sees the three dots, like, um, appear on one of her friends, and then, like, the guy gets taken out with, like, you know, the spear bolts or whatever, and then she, like, you know, five minutes later, 
sees the same dots appear on like another one of her friends and then she's just like oh i know what that is and like mm -hmm. causes them to duck you know yep. and then she sees after her brother knocks the mask off the predator when he's going to shoot the dog that the mask is uh showing those three dots uh guiding them and that guides where those spears yeah. go and then eventually uses that to ultimately take out the predator with his own weapon while calling back to the first movie with the like come on come on do it yeah <laughs> and like not in like a blatant but like uh, annoying way it's like she's she's not doing an arnold while she's saying that line she's making it her own well, yeah, well i think that that's that's something that i like love about this movie is like the callbacks to the previous movie are like delivered in such a different context in such a different way that they don't read as parody yeah so like you know for example when um dakota peaver's character says if it bleeds we can, we can kill, kill it, it. Mm. yeah like one huge applause in the room for sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like the way that he says it is like it, like when arnold it says makes it, complete sense like when arnold says it in the first predator it's just kind of like bravado mm -hmm. whereas like when this dude's doing it he's doing it like while tied to a tree with his sister and he's just like i think i know how to get us out of this mm -hmm. you know and um you know the come on come on do it like um like her exact phrasing that she uses in prey is something that's directly set up earlier in the movie of like i think it's um her um it's either her brother or um, I think her mom, the tribal elder that's talking to her. They're talking about how like, you know, when you're doing your rite of passage, if, it, if like the creature is like going towards you, you have to say like, you know, you have to say once it gets to a certain point, like mm -hmm. you this don't say stop, no you say further. this far, no further or something yeah. like that. So like, she's not saying, come on, come on, do it, do it. She's saying that exact thing that she learned that's like the end of her rite of passage. So mm -hmm. it's like even using that as something that like, it's not just a reference, it's like, really applies to like what this character's journey is and like pays it off in just a spectacular way. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, th this movie, like I guess that kind of reminded me of how, like I think this movie's such a good example of how to do an installment in a long running franchise where yeah, there is this lore and there is all of this kind of mythology built up over the years that we've been getting all these sequels is like, you don't have to overload. Like this is the opposite of that new Ghostbusters movie what was it ghostbusters afterlife, afterlife. right Where, i didn't see that to be fair so <laughs> yeah i was like when did you see that but just, <laughs> for you like even just watching the trailer it's like let's just load as much stuff as we can from this franchise is the feeling i got from that where it's like oh you remember this thing you know this thing like going through almost a checklist almost to make up for how pissed people were about that other ghostbusters movie that came out uh, yeah like I, I saw ghostbusters afterlife and they go so far that like pretty much every five seconds something happens that reminds you of the previous Ghostbusters to the point that like a serious dramatic scene will be happening and then the old Ghostbusters score of just like saxophones oh, will kick no. in. And it's just like, yeah, it's like some dramatic thing happens and then three seconds later you hear like da 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 and it's just like <laughs> Uh, it's like totally doesn't make sense. Yeah, and it's like you can do a sequel where you're referencing stuff, but this is like such a masterclass in yeah. how to do it, where it's recontextualizing things. Yeah, it's like yeah, and it's motivated, and not just there for you to be like, I know, I recognize that. So I remember when, that from that first movie. When I, I I don't I know her name off the top of my head, but the um the composer for this oh yeah um, oh yeah she, lady composer yeah she, yeah she was phenomenal i think that she composed one of the assassin's creed movies and then yeah. the director is just a gamer so he was like this is an amazing score come compose my prey movie mm -hmm. and um you know there are like leitmotif references to the original predator movie but there's also like she got a bunch of like comanche musical instruments like oh, cool. that were traditionally used by the tribe to like just give it that level of like yeah you know like vibe and feel so, you know, just like every aspect of this movie was like done with such care and it's so it's so Yeah, good. this movie's so music good. theme I really like and it, I think it plays over the end credits and it's just like, it, we let the end credits just roll because it was yeah, so yeah. good to listen to. Nice. Sarah, I don't know how to say this, uh, Sh 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 Schachner? Schachner, maybe? It's, it's two CHs in the span of five letters and it's, uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, dodgy, yeah. <laughs> a little dodgy there. Uh. <laughs> in 2016, Ted Cruz's presidential campaign used one of her songs without permission, and uh, she sued the campaign. Good. I was going to say she grew a beard and shaved it and mailed it to them. Yeah, that was me. That's what I did. <laughs> Never, sorry, that was, was Joey. Was that 2016 as yeah, well? That yeah, that was 2016. Right? Yeah. I grew a long beard. I was. Uh, I basically just posted on social media, hey, if anybody wants me to mail this beard to them, I'll do it. <laughs> And then one of my friends commented, uh, Jesse Klein, super funny comedian, uh, you should shave it off and mail it to Ted Cruz. <laughs> and I was like, 
Yeah, yeah, you're right. I should. So I shaved it off into a Ziploc bag. And then I put a note in there that was just like, my campaign donation. And then I put a $1 bill in there, knowing that Ted Cruz was for sure going to make an intern fish a $1 bill out of this bag of wet human hair. And I just put it in a thing and enveloped it. And it got covered by like, I don't know, like a bunch of different Yeah, websites. I remember that. I feel like that went like. Yeah, you can Google that. Yeah, you can yeah. Google that. I think Elite Daily or something like that did a write up about it. Oh my god! Um, How'd you guys feel about the CG animals? I don't. It's fine. Yeah, they were fine. I, I thought they mind. were fine. I saw a lot of people complaining about it online. I don't mind CGI. You, okay. I think the wolf looked great when it was hunting that rabbit. Yeah. yeah. I think that looked fantastic. And all the other CG animals, I was like, I don't know. The, you gotta have an, they're animals in the story, and you're not gonna have a real bear. So. Did you see RRR? No, I okay, still need to. Speaking of anti-colonial movies with CGI animals. Yeah, I need to see that for like 20 different reasons. It dude, kicks so much ass. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Uh, that I think India has laws about using animals in films. So like there's even a, a title card before RR starts that's like, these are all CGI animals because of this like rule and which I think makes total sense. I don't care when an animal is clearly CGI because I kind of almost just like knowing it's not a real animal. Yeah, I, I mean, just, you know. look, spoiler, the Predator was also CGI for a lot of the movie too. Like, yeah, you know, I think all that stuff looks real good. There's a lot yeah, of, yeah. there's like, I was looking at the IMDb and there are like five puppeteers credited also. Because there were some shots where you could tell the face was practical. All the, oh, the, for like, sure. Like mandibles yeah. and stuff. Oh yeah, and, Predator always has a... A lot of practical elements to him. It's it's more when the camouflage kicks in that that's when the you, and the I weapons mean, themselves. To be fair, <laughs> how yeah. would you do that? I think that I think that the animals. I think they did the job. Like yeah. I think that mm -hmm. they. I think that they sold. And I think that like you know like the bear getting sliced open and then its blood being yeah. used yeah. To, like yeah. lifting yeah. it. It's like around. that. Just I don't know CGI or not. That looked real cool. Yeah. Like, um, Although I will say, you know what? I think that that bear could have won that fight had it not been for the invisibility. I think that that bear was putting up a good fight, and it wasn't until Predator went invisible again, and the bear was running, and Predator literally punched it to death. That was how he won. I don't know. The bear was doing pretty good. I mean, the wolf also got some licks in, you know? Yeah. wolf got a good bite in, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it's like, I mean, it, but that's... <laughs> I think that th this is definitely the story of this predator also learning how to like eventually get to the point where they're destroying an entire camp of French fur traders <laughs> yeah. who have pistols. You know? Yeah, and it's like you don't you you don't start with him destroying that French fur trader village. You start with him, you know, like clearly yeah, like learning. Yeah, this predator's not a Mary Sue. All yeah, right. yeah, yeah, this predator's yeah. not a Mary yeah, Sue. Yeah, they do have and like And if a it was, parallel. there's never been a predator Mary <laughs> yeah. Sue before. Yeah, yeah. So it's so like predator, look, so look, the predator should have a could get <laughs> yeah. a Mary Sue too. The predator has um, purple and pink hair and is also magic, and all the boys at school like them the most. Yeah, so. I mean that was what all the lines in French were was them being like that predator's cute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That I wish predator. I could date. I wish yeah, that predator would no go. No subtitles on the French lines. I guess put us in the same position as our characters with um, unless you speak French not really knowing what they're saying what they're doing yeah I don't yeah. think you need to either you kind of fake like when, context clues <laughs> when I, I think that, that that's another thing that I think is so cool about this movie is like I like played it with Comanche or I played the Comanche dub version of it which you have to turn the subtitles on for it mm -hmm. and like I watched it for like five or ten minutes without it and I was like I don't really need the. I mean, you get it. Everybody's performances are so great. Like, mm -hmm. and the, like, there's not a ton of dialogue in this movie. It's largely just Amber Mid Thunder just being a great actor on camera and also a predator. And it's like, you don't like, you don't need to understand the dialogue. Like, it still it still reads as you understand the story. You know? Yeah, yeah. especially like I feel like the age the characters are. You kind of understand this is a bit of a coming of age thing yeah. too. It's like, yeah, that's it's a simple story. That's what makes it work really well. Yeah, and, and another another cool detail about this is, um, like, I went to a premiere of this in Los Angeles, but they also did a premiere of this um, on the homeland of the Comanche Nation in Oklahoma oh, cool. and invited a ton of, like, Comanche tribal members to see the movie. Dude, I bet that was a party. Oh, that, like, <laughs> oh I, looked, I saw God. pictures. That looked like it was just the fun. And, like, they played specifically the Comanche dub at that. Oh, it's like, cool. oh, so oh that must have been, like, yeah, I mean, like, you know, that, that's something to, you know, stress with all of this stuff is, like, uh, the Comanche Nation is still a thriving people in Oklahoma. Like mm -hmm. native people are, this is a period piece, but like, we're still here. Mm -hmm. Look, we can fight the predator. Now. I probably, I couldn't fight the predator. Now, <laughs> it's like, look, Amber Mid Thunder, I'm pretty sure could beat up a predator in real life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
Oh man, this was great. Thank you so much for joining us for this. I just, I saw you tweet about like, I will come on your show to talk about this and just immediately took you off. <laughs> yeah, it was a really good timing because we were like, timing. should we talk about Prey? And then we saw that tweet and was like, yes, yeah. we're talking All about right. Prey this week. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, thanks for having me. It's such a, like, it's, I mean, one, you know, we're all friends, so I like hanging out. <laughs> Uh, in your in your palatial basement. Yes, in your uh, basement. But um, you know, besides that, this is a movie that, like, you know, I didn't work on it. I have nothing to do with it professionally. But I think it's just such a cool movie that I like want people to see, and also just like love it and want to talk about it. Yeah. Um, and you know, one more time, you know, shout out to you know Jane Myers, the super badass producer who's Comanche, who really. Uh, you know, pushed for a lot of the the great representation in this. You know, um, I mentioned Ma- Amber Mid Thunder a bunch, who um, is the star of this. Who like, I'm so excited that we have like a native action movie star who's like a badass native woman now. So now, yeah, like, she's only 25. So yeah, I hope she's 25. She has a, oh my a god, big Twitter yeah. just my entire Twitter feed is just simping hard for her. <laughs> yeah, which yeah. Is good for yeah, her. Yeah, so it's just like she shout out. It. Yeah, so it's like shout out to Amber Mid Thunder. You know, like, like I said, this is the first ever major motion picture to like star a native woman and like that's or that's i mean it's like it sucks that it took so long but it's cool that it exists yeah. you know do you and, know anything about patrick Asen, who the screenwriter uh, uh i don't think he, uh i don't think he's native okay uh, yeah it's like the it was more of the director shame. and the yeah it's basically the director and the two writers aren't native okay but they like clearly like empowered jane to yeah. do her job you know yeah. like and i think that that's something that's so like i mentioned earlier like with Hollywood movies, oftentimes they'll just hire like a native consultant a week before the movie's about to mm-hmm. shoot just to be like, tell us if this is racist or not. Mm-hmm. Oh, it is? We didn't hear that. Like, yeah. Whereas this is something where it's clear they had Jane in in the early going of this movie to like really, you know, manicure and make sure the native representation was cool. And it's like, this to me is the bar now. Like yeah. if you're uh, if you work in movies and you want to make a movie that has native characters or is about native characters, like this is the bar you need to hit. Like, and there's no reason y- you can't. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's it, obviously this movie isn't like hampered in any way by that accuracy. Yeah. It's, it's fucking awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Dakota Beaver's first ever acting role knocked it out of the park. So good. Yeah. yeah. It's so likable. Both of them. Yeah. Both likable. It's just so like such likeable. a bad, it's like, you know, I want there to be, a, I want there to be a prey too, but I also want all of the, I mean, all of the people who worked on this movie, but all the native people who worked on this movie to like have long careers and are, are able to like work on other cool projects. Like I can't wait to see what all these people like spider web off into and work on, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. More horror movies. Please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Uh, where can people find you online if they want? Uh, great. Yeah. You can find me on Twitter at Joey Tainment. You can find me on Instagram at Joey Clift with five or six eyes. The reason for that's a 12 year old took Joey Cliff with one eye and I just got a deal. Um, and uh, yeah, I would say those are the main places you can find me on social media and then um, things I'm working on to check out. I've got a, short film that's currently going through the festival circuit called My First Native American Boyfriend that uh, comes out uh, on the internet in the near future. And then I'm a writer, consulting producer on a show called Spirit Rangers on Netflix, yeah. which is the first ever kids TV show in the history of US animation created by a native person uh, with an all native writer's room, you know, native actors playing native characters and stuff like that. And that comes out on Netflix in just a couple months. So definitely check that it's, out. It's premieres on Netflix? Yeah, premieres on Netflix cool. in just a couple cool. months. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Hell yeah. Yeah. I think there's from, like from what I've seen of it, there's like a lot of cute animals and stuff. It's in it. adorable. Yeah, yeah, it looks really, really cute. Cool. Uh, your social media, James? Yeah, well, Dead Meat James is Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can find us there. Yeah, and I'm at Carebeck, C R E B E C C. I almost forgot how to spell it on Twitter yeah. and Instagram. And if you want merch, deadmeatstore.com. Yeah, check out that merch. Check it does out exist. That merch. We should also plug that more. Also, Everybody who worked on this movie, follow them on Twitter. Find them. I'm promoting. Yes. I'm promoting everybody who worked on this movie. Follow them on the socials. For sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, cool. Um, I guess until next time, because we're filming this way ahead of time, so I don't even know what time is anymore. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Time's not real. Yeah. So until next time, I'm Chelsea. I'm James. That's Joey. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and this has been the Dead Meat Podcast. Oh yeah. Thanks, Grasshopper, for producing. Yeah. <laughs> What's up?